Uh, that's also a different type of discretion that's been afforded. And then judges, your discretion relative to how you're going to sentence somebody, we're going to be taking a look at that Come as on. well. To I've been arguing for, for 15 years. Please don't put people in jail and prison, jail and prison for marijuana. It has completely fell upon deaf ears until they learned how to tax it and make a profit off in of it. I echo everything that everyone else also said, but I think um, from a practical standpoint, I would just say to everybody on one of your days off, if you feel like it, come and watch court because you will see the attitudes and how people are treated and what's actually happening on a day-to-day -day practical basis when you come into the courtroom. largest organization of African-American judges, associates, law professors, and other legal professionals. At this time, I would like to introduce our vice president, Dr. Brittany Watkins, to discuss the purpose of this forum and to put it in its proper social context. Dr. Watkins is an attorney at Personnel Advice and the first African-American woman elected to the state bar of Nevada Board of Governors. She will be sworn in on Monday. Dr. Watkins. Thank you, Augusta. Welcome everybody to Breathe Two Forward, hosted by the Las Vegas chapter of the National Bar Association and Assemblywoman Dina Neal. This is our second virtual forum addressing, addressing racial justice. We hosted our first forum, a vigil, in the days following George Floyd's murder. Breathe One was focused on allowing members of the community to breathe, to express themselves. I was personally frustrated and upset about the loss of another black life in police custody. Like so many others, I thought that could have been my son. My oldest son is 13 and I worry about sending him out into a world that is implicitly or explicitly perceives danger when they see the color of his skin. But we don't have to be able to imagine that it could have been our son to want justice for George Floyd or the other victims of racial justice, or to want a justice system that lives up to the ideal of justice for all. If altruism is a tough sell, we need only be concerned with ourselves to want justice. We need not be reminded that in, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Injustice has no bounds. Furthermore, many of us in this forum are lawyers and in accordance with our attorney oath, administration of justice is central to our call of duty. You can find our oath posted on the State Bar's website. To the point, whatever your reason for acting, it is simply imperative to act. We are here today for Breathe Two, to act. Making the decision to act is based on an understanding or at least a hope that change can be had. And it can. We are not bound by the history of racism in this country. Just as individuals can become anti-racist, so too can the systems that human beings build and operate, including the justice system. But that change will not come without action. As Dr. Ibram Kendi said, as he explained in his book, How to Be Anti-Racist, it is not enough to be non-racist to achieve a society that is not racist. We have to be anti-racist and that requires affirmative steps. We have a real change at comprehensive reform thanks to the millions who have taken to the streets and called upon their elected officials demanding justice. We are here today to channel that energy into legislative action, policy action, and an all around cultural shift where it is no longer a norm to wake up to news of another black or brown person killed in police custody. Breathe Two is about stepping into a new era where equal justice under the law is the standard, not a privilege. It is about collective action. It is about collect a collective word before the next chapter. Thank you for joining us. 
also joining us is Senator Catherine Cortez Masto. Born and raised in Las Vegas, Senator Catherine Cortez Masto made history by becoming the first woman from Nevada and the first Latina ever elected to the United States Senate. Prior to becoming a senator, she served two terms as Attorney General of Nevada. Welcome, Senator Masto. Brittany, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. I want to say also thank you to Assemblywoman Neal, uh, as well as the Las Vegas chapter of the National Bar Association for hosting this important forum. And thank you all for joining. I know you've got an incredible uh, panel uh, of individuals that are just going to engage in important discussion. I think we can all agree what happened to George Floyd, Ahmed Arbery, Arbery, Rihanna Taylor, and countless other Black Americans, it is unacceptable. And yet, it is the reality for Black communities in the United States. Uh, we cannot let this brutality continue. You know, I agree with the calls for action, for meaningful reform, and for structural changes to address the vast racial inequities and equalities that exist in our justice system, in policing, and across all levels of government and society. And I know that any legislative and permanent progress is first going to require us to listen, to listen to the perspectives and realities of Black Americans. And, and listening, sometimes it is hard. It, it requires us to put ourselves aside and invest in the truth of others' experiences. It will challenge our preconceptions, and it demands that we be non-judgmental and non-defensive. It prompts us to question the ways in which Racism still threatens black communities and impacts black children's hopes, dreams, and self-image. Through listening, we will better understand the proposed solutions and effective policies that need to be implemented to root out the interconnected web of systemic racism that still exists in our country. That is why I am so grateful for the forum today and the many others that have occurred across this state. While the fight for true equity in this country is far from over, I believe that together we will make real positive change for our future and our children's future. So thank you for inviting me to, to speak with all of you today, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Senator. Um, next up, I'm going to introduce you to the chair of our Racial Justice Committee, Caleb Green. Caleb Green is also the chair of our Corporate Sponsorship and Funding Committee. Thank you for serving, uh, Caleb. Caleb is also the, um, he's also an attorney practicing intellectual property at Dixon, Dickinson Wright. So, we welcome you, and uh, Caleb is going to handle our logistics for us. So go ahead, Caleb, take us there. Thank you, Dr. Watkins. Um, and, uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I'd like to recognize Senator uh, Cortez Masso for her, her wonderful remarks. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to do a brief run through of our agenda and then go over some of the guidelines, and then I will hand it. Um, over to our moderator for today. So uh, following me, we will have an introduction of the speakers by our moderator, uh, Rachel Anderson. Uh, that will be followed by our panel discussion and questions for our speakers. We'll then enter a dialogue with our community stakeholders. Uh, that will be followed by an afterword by Rachel Anderson. And we will return with remarks from our president, uh, guidelines that we just want everyone to be mindful of. Um, everyone will be muted upon entry. Um, there are time limits um, for our panelists and for speakers, so please be mindful. Um, we ask that everyone remain respectful. Um, if you have questions, feel free to put those in the chat box and we will address those uh, towards the end. Um, during our uh, stakeholder conversation, um, if you have a question, uh, you can either use the raise your hand function on Zoom or you can type X in the chat box. Um, we ask you that you keep your remarks to three minutes um, and unmute yourself 
uh, when we address you. Um, and with that, I will move forward and introduce our moderator for today. Um, that is Rachel Anderson. Rachel Anderson is currently the general counsel for the office of the Nevada Attorney General. She's also a professor at the William S. Boyd School of Law at UNLV. She's also the past president of the of LVNBA, and she is the former secretary of the National Bar Association. So I'll hand it over to Rachel Anderson at this time. Thank you, Caleb. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So as Caleb said, I will introduce the speakers, and then uh, we have uh, two prepared questions for which the uh, panelists have had an opportunity to uh, think about in advance, and I will uh, uh, call on them in the order um, that we have them in our agenda. Uh, and then uh, if there's time allowed, I will ask follow-up questions related to their comments or allow them to comment on each other's remarks. Before I introduce the speakers, I will take uh, about five seconds of moderator's privilege to say that in preparing for this, I'm not usually emotional preparing for panels, but the first police community policing event that I was involved in was after the killing of Trevon Martin, and it was together with Dr. Watkins and Assemblywoman Neal. So to be doing this panel now um, feels deeply meaningful in both positive and negative ways. I hope that will come out in the positive direction. And I'm now going to introduce our panelists. It is my honor to introduce uh, first Professor Rank Frank Rudy Cooper from the UNLV Boyd Law School. Professor Rank Cudi for, well, excuse me, Professor Frank Rudy Cooper, who I know well uh, and have for many years, uh, teaches and researches the course criminal procedure, uh, police, especially in light of the intersectionality of race, gender, and class. Uh, second, I will introduce my current boss, uh, the Attorney General of Nevada, Attorney General Aaron D. Ford. Attorney General in 2019, and is the first African-American to take statewide constitutional office. Before being elected Nevada's Attorney General, Dr. Aaron Ford served as the majority leader of the Nevada State Senate. Uh, Co-sponsor of this event is the person that I will uh, uh, introduce next, Assemblywoman Dina Neal. Assemblywoman Dina Neal has been in the Nevada legislature for 10 years and served as chair of taxation for four years. She's a graduate of Southern University Law School, and she received her undergraduate degree in political science. Next, I will introduce Donovan McIntosh. Donovan McIntosh was born and raised in Trenton, New Jersey. He is a U.S. Army and law enforcement veteran. He holds a degree in criminal justice and is one of the newest members of the NAACP. And lastly, oh, please. Oh, you're just raising your hand to, got it. Uh, and lastly, I will introduce Belinda Harris. Belinda T. Harris is Chief Deputy Public Defender. She was born and raised in North Las Vegas. Belinda is currently running for judge in North Las Vegas Justice Court Department 3 to serve the community that raised her. Welcome to all of the panelists. So now I will ask the first question and then I will give each of you an opportunity to respond in the order that you were introduced. And each of these questions has multiple parts. As it relates to racial justice in policing, what are the immediate issues of concern, the scope of those issues, and the barriers to addressing those issues as examined from the position you hold? First, we'll turn to Professor Rudy Cooper. Hi, folks. Uh, first, thank you to Assemblywoman Neal, to the LVNBA, and to Rachel uh, for convening this discussion. So uh, Professor Anderson uh, does ask tough questions, and I'm going to try and break this down into a couple of components so that I'm clear. So I wanted to start by saying I come from a state, Massachusetts, which is known for being the most liberal state in the country. But I'm especially proud to now call Nevada my home because I see the Black community here as a powerful force in the state. And that's because of the elected officials uh, that we have here, but it's also because of leaders throughout the community 
uh, including activists who have been pushing for progress with respect to policing. So I'm really um, grateful to be at Boyd School of Law and to have some of the fantastic students that I have in the balsa there, which is uh, really well organized. So my position, I am the director of UNLV Boyd's program on race, gender and policing. And I'm pleased to co-facilitate that program with professors Addie Rolnick and Stuart Chang. In a nutshell, we are professors and students who push for progress in policing. Our mission is to foster research and concrete reforms in Nevada, the nation and beyond. And so we've put out editorials, we've hosted events for both students and the larger community. And in all of these forums, we have been calling for progress on policing. And our events have included a movie and discussion about the Oscar Grant killing, uh, sessions on police use of force under the law at the Mob Museum, a conference on policing at the UNLV Boyd School of Law, and dialogues with community leaders about policing and where it might go in the future. So we're available to the elected officials, uh, we're available to think tanks, we're available to activists, and to other parties seeking police reform. And what we do is we research and we advocate. And I hope that uh, you will look us up. If you do a search for race, gender, policing, and UNLV, you will get the uh, UNLV program on race, gender, and policing. So that's part one. What are the issues of concern? So this July special session is a pivotal moment where Nevada will either follow Colorado in making significant changes right now during the protests, or it will be revealed as just paying lip service to social justice. I encourage everybody who's listening to contact your elected officials and tell them that there should be no budget action without police reforms. And that to me is the big thing that of course, some of this is in the long haul, but we have the legislature convening next week uh, and they need to do something, sorry, in two weeks, and they need to do something about social justice. So what should they do? Uh, I have three things that are priorities. One is police officers should be privately suable for use of force. And that means that they have an affirmative duty to intervene if they see police misconduct. They have no qualified immunity and that we publish all municipal and county payouts for police misconduct, including through indemnification of police officers. So that's the first thing. Second thing, our attorney general, who won't always be as wonderful as we have right now, uh, should conduct they have the power to conduct pattern and practice investigations into local police departments on use of force, but also on racially disparate policing in general. And thirdly, I think that cities of 25,000 or greater should have civilian only police oversight boards with subpoena power. So those are the three things that I encourage. Uh, lastly, the barriers, two big barriers. One is that uh, police unions, and I'm a fan of unions, um, but the police unions at this point have too much power in conjunction with the district attorney to dictate what kind of uh, efforts the public makes. And that's just wrong. That's a barrier to progress. And then secondly, I think, is a lack of connection between the institutional players and activists. And certainly the program on race, gender, and policing wants to play a role in connecting activists on the ground with institutional players and helping everybody to figure out what would be the best practices for Nevada. So uh, that's my answer to that question. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much, Professor Cooper. Uh, now I will turn to Attorney General Aaron D. Ford. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Professor Anderson, uh, General Counsel Anderson. And by the way, uh, no one's the boss of you. So uh, thanks for working with me in my office. Um, and thank you to the LBNBA for putting this on. Uh, let me pay homage at the outset to one of my predecessors, Senator Catherine Cortez Masto, 
uh, who's led the way on so many different uh, great things in our state um, and to whom I turn uh, on frequent occasions to get advice on things that we're doing currently. So thank you so much, Senator, for being here, uh, as well as to my fellow panelists, uh, including my former colleague, Senator Woman Dina Neal. Thank you for putting this on. Uh, I'm delighted to be here to talk, delighted in, in air quotes, however. Um, I view this as an opportunity, yet again, uh, in air quotes, because I hate the fact that we're talking about opportunities in the context of another person dying at the hands of law enforcement. Uh, but uh, where we are uh, is at a uh, another part of the conversation, uh, a conversation that I've said time and again um, should be over. We should be done conversing by now, uh, or at least close to being done, uh, and seeing the implementation of policies, practices, and procedures that uh, help facilitate better community relations between law enforcement and the communities in which they serve. Um, you know, P Professor uh, Frank Rudy uh, Cooper just uh, detailed a handful of ideas, two of which overlap with mine on things that we that we need to do um, relative to trying to address this issue, uh, including offering my office through state legislative action, the ability to do pattern and practice investigations uh, into law enforcement agencies that have uh, been alleged to have dis uh, discriminatory conduct toward particular communities. Uh, I have asked the federal government to do that, and thank goodness Senator C Captain Cortez Masto um, has listened to me in that regard and, and others. Uh, myself and 18 other attorneys general uh, asked for the federal government to give us the same authority that they've given the Department of Justice at the federal level to, in to institute those types of investigations. And so we're hoping to have building suspenders, if you will, where we get to have the opportunity to look into those departments. Uh, I also agree uh, that uh, we need to have uh, policies that, that are similar to what you can find on the website, 8 Can't Wait, uh, the number 8 Can't Wait, I believe it's .org. Uh, and some of those suggestions you've heard Mr. Rudy Cooper already talk about, and they relate to, for example, uh, the duty to intervene. Uh, many police uh, departments already have that duty to intervene, and others have in the immediate aftermath of the Frank uh, of the uh, um, George Floyd killing have um, uh, begun to institute that, including, for example, uh, Sheriff in Washoe County, pardon me, the uh, Chief of Police in Reno, um, Chief Soto, immediately thereafter uh, requested that a policy be drafted in that regard. And so uh, I'm, I'm proud to see the policies being implemented. But but here, here's the catch. Here's the issue. Uh, it's not so much the existence of a policy that makes the difference. It's the enforcement of that policy that makes the difference when it comes to the relationships between the communities uh, that are supposedly served by law enforcement. Uh, if you have a duty to intervene that is not enforced, uh, where there's no ramification that uh, uh, is, is affected uh, in the circumstances where one officer doesn't intervene or doesn't report on uh, misconduct, then the public won't, won't have a reason to trust in law enforcement. And so what we need to be doing is ensuring that there are opportunities uh, for the public to know, now I get human resources and I get privacy and I get due process, but we also need instances of transparency that allow the public to believe and know that if something, if an injustice uh, occurs, that the fair and impartial matching of justice will follow. Uh, and I don't believe the majority of us on this screen, those of us who are watching this on Facebook, those of us who, uh, who will hear this otherwise, believe that that actually occurs right now. Uh, which leads to uh, the third part of my answer to the question relative to what are the barriers. The barriers are these, um, at a minimum, and these. this is not an exhaustive list. I, I'm known to say we live in the silver state, but there is no silver bullet when it comes to a lot of the problems we have to address. So these are a few of the barriers that, that I will bring up, one of which is inertia, um, just the, the, the status quo being so difficult to, to move beyond and inertia being in the way. Um, inertia oftentimes lends itself to something you've heard uh, Frank Rita Cooper say, and that's lip service. That inertia leads to lip service, which oftentimes manifests itself, uh, itself in, the, in the adoption of policies, again, as opposed to the enforcement of those policies. But what generally follows that, that, that lip service um, is complacency. The public gets complacent. They, they, they have a three-week memory, a three-month memory. Um, this is not the first time we've had this discussion or we've had to come together, as Rachel Anderson said early on. Trayvon Martin was an instance, just one example of an instance where we've had this conversation around Black lives being lost. Uh, in that instance, not necessarily at the hand of law enforcement, but generally speaking, uh, trying to come together and find opportunities for progress moving forward. Complacency is a barrier. Uh, and the fortunate thing is this, we're all home, we're stuck, 
uh, because of COVID-19 and for a change, we don't have the distraction of turning on baseball or a basketball or some other uh, something that can take our minds off of what we're seeing on television, which right now uh, are protests in support of Black Lives Mattering. Uh, and we have the opportunity right now in July when Assembly Woman Neil and her colleagues go up to Carson City uh, to effectuate changes in law that I believe are going to happen uh, so that we can actually see changes take place, notwithstanding the barriers that exist. So again, thanks for having me here and looking forward to the conversation. Uh, thank you very much, Attorney General uh, Ford. Uh, next, I will turn to Assemblywoman Dina Neal. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, number one, hosting this and asking me to co-host with you. Um, I really appreciate it. And uh, Attorney Anderson, when you said uh, where we started in 2011, um, I, that brought back so many memories because um, the issues that are of immediate concern for me right now tie into why we started the youth justice workshop in the first place, which was youth voices. And when you had to hear the cries of Trayvon, when his mom said, I hear him on the video, on the 911 call. And then we have fast forward to Elijah McLean in Colorado, who was cold, so he wore a face mask. And the video tells us that he kept telling the officers, I can't breathe. And he was like, and they knocked his glasses off. And, and my question was still, why is it that youth protest and, and they put it out there that, why is it that as a black male, I can't walk home from the store with, a bag of Skittles or a bag of chips, whether it be 10 o'clock at night, why is my presence seen as villainous, criminal, and not just simply the same as a white young male who was walking home from the store? And why, why is it that it's a constant um, assumption that we have to deal with, but that we can never fight because the interpretation nationally, in the society and psychologically, we don't see them as non-criminal. And I think that's one of my major concerns because I was able to sit with some protesters uh, two days ago at a church. Young protesters, they were, it was interesting because they were black, they were Asian, they were Latino. And they talked about that there's no respect for their voices. It's not a two-way street that they see when we protest, the interpretation is that it's a problem, that it's not our first amendment, it's not our freedom of assembly, that it's a problem for us to be in the street. Not acknowledging that the reason why we're out is because of the pain that we're accessing and feeling and trying to voice. And this seems to be the only way to do it, which is in mass. And, so that concerned me because part of our youth justice workshop was a two-way street. A respect is two ways. Trust is two ways. If I trust you, you should trust me in return. Like some of the protesters said, that they, when the infiltrators, because we knew there were infiltrators who went into protest to change the peacefulness, that they said they went to the police and they said, we know that there are some people harassing business owners and they're not a part of our group. And rather than the police moving, they said, we can't get off the corner. And they felt like they didn't trust the young protesters on telling them what was going on. But then the next day in the media, it was the protesters caused all this violence. They caused, they harassed business owners. But yet at the, at the moment it was happening, they told the police, it's not us. They're these outsiders. So it made me think, we have a trust problem. Because we've already decided that the protest is a problem, not a constitutional right. And that in of itself is a societal issue that I think we need to deal with and we need to address because we don't really see this as change. We see it as a temporary problem that we're hoping it ends soon. And so that's my immediate concern. The barriers that I feel are popping up are 
in my 10 years in the legislature, I try to guard against emotional legislation. I always want legislation to be logical and I want it to apply to real situations and real human beings. And we're real, but cops are also humans as well. And so I, I want to make sure that as we go to our legislative session, it's balanced legislation that deals with systemic issues of what's going on, um, that we come to the table, and, and also that people who are, in, in Attorney General's words, giving lip service, because I do feel that there's not true sincerity. I think people are using it and saying, okay, I don't want to be on the hot spot. I don't want to be called out for not being in alignment with the political movement that's going on. But as soon as I see you vote opposite my beliefs, I'm probably going to try to unelect you out of office, right? So I see that as a true political barrier because politics is real. And I, and I see these undercurrents coming up where people are speaking and saying, you know, everything is okay. You guys are complaining about the wrong thing. But yet at the same time, we had an incident with the guy at the um, Bonanza and MOK, although he was on meth, said he couldn't breathe and he was pulled over because his little tail light on his back on his bike was not functioning. He's no longer with us. So we do have a problem. And the problem is training. The problem is, are you going to adequately train to the standards that are necessary and be consistent across board and call out the officers who are not necessarily performing every way that you would like to? And I close and I finalize this because the chief, when I looked at one of our former videos, um, he is now a captain at North Las Vegas Police. But he said when he was a sergeant and he gave the story to the students, he said, I was pulled over. And until I showed my badge and told them who I was, that's when the encounter changed. But the rest of us don't have a badge. All we have is, my name is Sam Jones. I believe you caught me speeding or whatever that criminal infraction was. And you're trying to navigate how to get out of the situation, get the ticket and go home. And if we have a, a, a captain who is saying that he had that same encounter and he has a badge, then what, what does that say for the rest of us? We got to deal with what's going on. And I'll just leave it there. Thank you, Assemblywoman Neal. I will now turn to Donovan McIntosh. Muted. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to I'd like to thank everyone, uh, Senator Cortez, Masto, Professor Anderson, uh, Attorney General Ford. Uh, public officials, Dina Nils, and uh, as well as members of the community for having me on. It is an honor uh, and a privilege. Um, secondly, um, my statements and my comments are mine alone and uh, are not the views of the organization that I work for. Um, to begin, I am a, uh, I'm a black man first, and I'm a 20-year veteran of law enforcement second. And uh, when the question was asked, what are the immediate concerns, uh, the scope of those issues and barriers to addressing those issues, uh, this kind of hit home to me because I have a black son, I have black children, and um, you know I've been pulled over and I understand that what happens uh, to some doesn't happen to all. Um, but there, there, are, there are five, five points that I wanted to make and address, the, uh, and address these questions. And uh, I can't help but feel a little emotional because it has been tough. I'm going to tell you, it's been tough being a cop and it has been tough being a black man because I don't always have my uniform on. And, and so, you know, when we, when we speak about these issues, I can tell you it has been, it has been rough on, on both sides of the fence. But uh, to begin with the five points, uh, there's tension on both sides, the black community, and people that care about the black community are tired and frustrated with the number of members of the African Americans that are being the subject of police brutality, unjust murders, and a sense of being targeted and hunted. 
Uh, the police community is tired of being lumped into the same category as bad officers, uh, as well as being the subjects of ambushes and also being targeted and hunted. Uh, there's racial tension. The overt racism that is being displayed throughout the United States has shown uh, no signs of leaving. Uh, the political tension. Uh, it's an election year, so, so this has played into a lot of the tension and the emotional state that we're going through. Unemployment. The uncertainty of our financial future has a lot of tension. Uh, the COVID-19 restrictions and the social distancing frustrations has also been uh, 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 attributed to the abnormalities of the day-to-day -day and also the knee-jerk reactions uh, with police officers being fired uh, without being afforded their due process as well as, well as uh, what we call the blue, blue flu. You have cops who took an oath to protect and serve who are walking off the jobs now uh, out of frustration. Another point I'd like to make is the breakdown in the link between upper management, elected officials, and the frontline workers. Uh, far too often, people move up the chain and forget about the day-to-day -day interactions with the public that certain officers on the front line have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, some people forget about the death and disturbing calls the front, lines work, or front line workers deal with on a regular basis and is forced to be stowed away, not to mention the emotional highs and lows on a frequent basis that, that takes its toll if these things aren't addressed. Uh, also the division between the people that want law and order versus the people uh, 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 versus the people that believe the only way to get attention or get answers is by causing chaos and anarchy. And as it pertains to barriers, I believe uh, respect on both parts plays a huge, huge roles in a lot of these encounters. Um, I believe that uh, there's a fear of making the first move towards peace based on past incidents that didn't yield any type of, uh, of positive responses or positive results. Um, communication. There's a definite breakdown in communication when you're talking about the law enforcement community and, and, and members of the black community. And, and, and there's frustrations on both sides. And, and, and it is evident that we're, uh, uh, there's posturing. And, and it is basically, I believe personally, that has locked us in a stalemate to the point where nobody wants to establish an open dialogue to address uh, these issues on both sides. And, and lastly, and, 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 and I, again, uh, I've been on the job for 20 and a half years. And one of the things that I, I personally believe that needs to be addressed is a 500 pound elephant in a room. Specifically, how did we get here in the first place? What led up to these certain events and what could have been done to prevent it? And what are we gonna do moving forward? Um, people often talk about uh, respect. Well, respect goes both ways. Uh, compliance. You take you take small you take small segments out of a lot of these incidents out, specifically fighting, resisting, running. You take some of these elements out, and you know there's a strong possibility that we may have a different outcome. And um, again, that's uh, that's my response. Uh, I'm definitely open to uh, 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 to questions. Thank you. I will now turn to our final speaker, Belinda Harris. Good afternoon, everyone. Belinda T. Harris here. Thank you all for being on the call. And I know this is super deep on a um, Saturday afternoon, but it is necessary. And so my answer to the question is two things, cultural competency and balance. We're lacking both. And it's really that, it's, it's not simple, but it really is that simple. So I am a chief deputy public defender. I have only ever been a public defender. I've been doing public defense work for 14 years. So this discussion, and, and to echo Ms. Anderson, is I am very happy to be having it, but I'm also sad to be having it at the same time too, because this is my life. This is what I, I'm in court for day after day, advocating, arguing um, about, not even less, we don't even have to go to like a homicide, but something as a, an infraction as a jaywalking or a reflection not on your bicycle or obstructing the roadway, uh, blocking the sidewalk or even down to misuse of a park bench. I think that before we go to the training and things of that nature, we have to get down to the nitty gritty of basic education. Everything that is happening here is historic. 
it's not like all of a sudden people of color and black people are just angry and upset at the police. This has some deep, deep roots and it's all history. It's all historic. Um, the protesting in the streets, the damage to property, the loss of lives, of lives. These are all things that have been continuing to happen before we can get any progress or any change to go forward. So what I would say is that to get the cultural competency and the balance, I think that a lot of times, um, Senator Jess was saying this, we don't listen. And it is, it's very hard to listen because often you get right on the defensive. You can't hear what the other person is saying because you might feel like they're being, they're attacking you or they're discrediting you or they, they don't, they just don't get it. They, they're not there with how you're feeling. So you definitely have to listen. And in these conversations, when you have a bunch of people who are usually in authority, um, and they're usually men, um, you have some other uh, things that come into factor when they're having these conversations. So one thing that I try to do is I try to make sure that I'm reading um, books, because when you're reading a book, books pose questions, and you can usually have a dialogue with somebody who may be different than you. I know um, Madam Vice President, Dr. Watkins, brought up Ibram Kennedy. I actually have the book right here. I was reading it earlier, How to Be an Anti-Racist. This is something that, you know, I think that all people who are in law enforcement, elected leaders, uh, prosecutors, public defenders, everybody should read this book because this book shines light on things from a different perspective. And then we could possibly have an open dialogue. I don't feel like honest and open conversations are being happening because I think that people are feeling attacked. And that, you know, um, we just heard from an officer and one of the things he says is, you know, like, it's been hard. It's been hard to be an officer right now. Um, if certain situations weren't to take place, then maybe the outcome could be better. As a public defender, I'm listening to him and I'm saying that most of the time people are being compliant. And as they're being compliant, they are not safe in the hands of the people they're being compliant with. But this is an honest and open conversation that possibly we could have. But I think that a lot of times we need we need a buffer. And I'm, I'm going back old school to books. I think that books would be the buffer because maybe I pick a book one week and maybe Chris Love picks the book the next week. And then we can have these open conversations to get different perspectives. But I think the barrier is if people actually want to do it. I think a lot of times people do just want to play lip service. And I do think a lot of times there is a big disconnect from elected officials to people who are on the ground to people who are in the middle. Um, and I'm saying that because I've been learning a lot just on a personal level as being a frontline worker, being a public defender in court, and now putting myself out there as a political candidate, even though judges are nonpartisan, um, it's still a, a politics are playing into it. So I think that that is one of the biggest barriers is that you have to be honest and people have to say whether they want to learn about it or whether they don't. And sometimes people just don't want to learn. They don't want to sit down and have the conversations. Um, I also think another thing is the enforcement of the different policies. I know the professor Cooper was giving out some examples, but here in the state of Nevada, we have no officer, police officer has ever um, been successful in being prosecuted um, because a lot of times they just go to the grand jury. They don't even bring it before the courts and things of that nature for a judge to make certain determinations. And based upon that, a lot of people in office, judges, they, instead of being fair, they go in fear because politics is a real thing. And you do get scared if you are coming up against a police department and then they invest on making sure that you don't get elected and you don't hold your seat. So I think that all of those things um, are different. And I think I need to answer one more part of the question. I have it here. Um, so that that's just my two cents in it. I echo everything that everyone else also said, but I think um, from a practical standpoint, I would just say to everybody on one of your days off, if you feel like it, come and watch court because you will see the attitudes and how people are treated and what's actually happening on a day-to-day -day practical basis when you come into the courtroom. And when you come into the courtroom, you will, whether unless you do have a badge, if you're just a normal person, if you're not a police officer, you will be treated accordingly and can witness some things that are literally just happening. And I think that's the problem is that it's too far of a disconnect. Before George Floyd, we were having these, I'll, a perfect example, marijuana. I've been arguing for, for 15 years, please don't put people in jail and prison, jail and prison for marijuana. 
it has completely fell upon deaf ears until they learned how to tax it and make a profit off of it. And even now, I still have some times where people are getting cases of marijuana. And I'm like, I can't plead them to that because marijuana is actually legal now. But they still want the conviction. So these are the things that we are battling against on a practical standpoint. And I just think it, it boils down to whether people really want to have the conversations and which means they're having to use the conversations, which one of my things would be to pick up a book, read it. Let's start a book club with diverse people to make sure that we can uh, have these conversations. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Attorney Harris, and thank you, panelists, for your thorough and thoughtful answers to our first question. I'll now turn to the second question. What actions are you taking in your position or otherwise to address the issues you describe, and how can other community leaders and stakeholders support your efforts or take action themselves to address these issues. And uh, while you're doing so, please provide contact information uh, for attendees who want to support your efforts. And I will uh, go in the same order as before. I will start with Professor Frank Rudy Cooper. Uh, thank you, Rachel. So with respect to what the program on race, gender, and policing is doing, there are several things that we're doing and they're aimed at both the short term and the long term. Uh, one of the things that we're doing that's most important, I think, in our role uh, is researching the issues. So um, that is a skill that we bring to bear on these problems. And uh, we are trying to find the best practices from across the country. We are looking at the Democrats uh, federal proposal. We are looking at Colorado's proposal, other states proposals, uh, what has worked and what hasn't worked out there, what the research says about what works. Um, and in doing that, I think we can play a role as uh, people who can help educate the public and legislators and also advocate for these best practices. So the first thing is sort of researching the issues. And there I wanted to point out, so I'm definitely in favor of the eight can't wait that uh, Attorney General uh, Ford mentioned. However, there's something else that I think we need to get to which is the definition of reasonableness. So as a lot of you will know as attorneys, there's a case called Wren versus US, which says that uh, if a police officer racial profiles somebody, but they also had some minor offense that the person did indeed commit, then the court doesn't care. And we are a sovereign state. <laughs> We do not have to follow the laws of the US Supreme Court on what is reasonable for police officers to do or not do. Um, and so one of the things that I would like to see us address is defining reasonableness such that if police officers are racial profiling, that makes it presumptively unreasonable what they did. That is, Reasonableness could start to mean what we would usually say reasonableness means. If you just pick somebody out because they're Black or Latinx or Asian American, and that's why you were really doing what you were doing, that's not reasonable. Even though you can also say, oh, but the person was chewing gum with their mask down while jaywalking. Who cares? That's not reasonable. So I just want to say that we need to do the things on use of force, but we also need to look further into what we can do about the role of uh, or the rule of law in Nevada on uh, reasonableness. A second thing that we're doing with the program is trying to affect the Boyd Law curriculum. Right now, the Boyd Law curriculum does have some very good courses with respect to civil rights and critical race theory and other matters that are particularly important to this community. Uh, but we're trying to do more. And I know some of my colleagues are on the line here and have proposed interesting courses that may come in the future. Uh, the reason I think this is important, as Attorney Harris said, we need people, not just Black people, to be culturally competent with other people. And so I'm certainly going to be pushing that part of raising up a lawyer is to teach them how to be co culturally competent across racial, 
gender, uh, other lines. Uh, and as uh, Attorney Harris said, sometimes people just don't want to learn. Well, that's okay. We're still going to bring them to the water. And we need them in this fight, right? We need uh, so white allies and allies from other communities in this fight. We have a lot we can do ourselves, but we also need allies in this fight, and we deserve allies in this fight. And so part of what we're doing is working on the curriculum. A third thing is trying to increase student involvement. Um, and I know there's actually a, a graduate, uh, Jessica White, who's on here, I see you out there, uh, who was uh, part of the sort of student group for the program on race, gender, and policing. And we're looking forward to working uh, particularly with BALSA, but also with students from all walks of life to try and figure out what are the types of programs we can bring to the students to educate them and to the community to help the community's voices be heard. So that's why I gave a shout out to the Forest Trajectory Project, who are some of the uh, most important activists in the community on policing issues. Uh, we want to work with all sorts of folks and magnify their voices. And uh, so we're doing some other things that the three main things are the uh, research, the curriculum, and student involvement. If you want to be in touch with me, uh, I am at Frank Rudy, F R A N K R U D Y dot Cooper at UNLV.edu. So that's to reach me. And then obviously, um, there are other folks involved with the program who would like to be involved in you know, making progress on these issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Cooper. And I hope you will include that information in the comment section uh, as well, okay. uh, or one of your colleagues. Um, I see there's a few of them on uh, uh, listening in as well. Uh, now I'd like to turn to Attorney General Ford. Uh, thank you again, Rachel. Um, so much to say, so many different uh, um, responses to this particular question. And um, I'm gonna offer a, a few thoughts. First of which is to agree with what Professor Frank Rudy Cooper just said um, about looking beyond just the use of force-based issues. Uh, and it dovetails into something that Belinda said a minute ago about uh, responsibilities. And, uh, and Caleb, you've heard me say this a hundred times, speak truth to power from your position of power. Um, it happens so frequently in so many different circumstances where uh, people get to a certain position in life, whether it's in your job or it's in your in political or whatever the case may be. And you get, um, to use my phrase earlier, complacent. You get afraid. You, you, you get to the point where you don't think you can actually speak out on certain issues or uh, 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 topics anymore because you might jeopardize your position or your title or whatever the case may be. And uh, that's unfortunate because if you do not utilize the position that you hold in order to effectuate a positive change, then you're wasting an opportunity. So what, what am I talking about when I say that? Um, you know, I, I'll never forget a couple of stories, one of which was sitting at a uh, at my conference room table when I was in the state Senate and a lobbyist uh, sitting next to me um, essentially threatened to take me on and, and have my uh, election be more difficult the next go around if I, if I pursued a particular course of action. And my response to him was, if the worst you're going to do is send me home to my wife and kids so I can spend more time with them, you're doing me a favor. And I proceeded to pass that, that piece of legislation that is in effect right now and is helping to save lives. Uh, it's that form of uh, unabashed unintimidation that you have to have if you're going to take on these forms of issues. Uh, you know, if this isn't political for me. Um, I'm a black man, uh, as I, we heard the police officer say. I was black when I was born. I was black before I was elected attorney general. I'm black as attorney general, and I'll be black when I'm not attorney general. Uh, and I'm married to a black woman, raising four black sons, three sons and a nephew. Uh, so th th this is a very unique opportunity that I have as the top law enforcement officer in the state um, uh, with that intersection to try to help bridge the gap in these circumstances. Um, but, you know, what, what we can't do uh, is to um, uh, shrink back from that particular responsibility and, you know, recognizing that this isn't just about a law enforcement issue. This isn't just about the criminal justice system. This is systemic um, in a broader sense of the word. And I reflect back on a story where my oldest boy, who is now 26, it'd be 27 on Monday, uh, was in the seventh grade in Texas taking an exam. And this is part of the problem. This is why the systemic nature of this has to be addressed and recognized. 
uh, he was taking an exam. It was a multiple choice exam. And the question was, what was the cause of the Civil War? You know where I'm going with this, don't you? The question was, what was the cause of the Civil War? Uh, it was multiple choice. It had four answers. The first two you can get rid of, process of elimination. The last two answers were slavery and states' rights. And the, the correct answer was, you guessed it, states' rights. And I was livid. And I went to my son's school and I, was, and, and I said to them, it's no wonder when a Black person complains about race-based issues, you say he's hypersensitive. Because you can't even admit that the Civil War was over slavery, which is the quintessential example of a racist issue. And so systemically speaking, the educational system was used to indoctrinate folks such that now we have this, 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 this perception that uh, we're hypersensitive on, on particular issues. And we cannot shy away from talking about the systemic nature of this as we continue to try to press forward. So what, what am I doing? I, I, I am addressing systemic issues. I'm talking about that. I'm, and beyond talking, I'm looking for opportunities to institute uh, solutions to that. Uh, Frank Rady, uh, Rudy uh, Cooper talked about um, the Wren case. We don't have to go back as far as Wren. You can go back to Street versus Utah, where um, uh, racial profiling was that much more ingrained in, as an opportunity. And I, and I failed in this, and, and I hurt my, and I, I feel bad about this all the time. I was in the Senate, Senate Majority Leader, and I sponsored a bill that tried to undo Straight versus Utah in the state of Nevada, because you're right, we can set our own standards when it comes to what's reasonable conduct. Um, and, and what that case said was uh, this dude who had just walked out of a crack house, they didn't see him buy crack, they didn't see him smoking crack, they didn't, it was, he was doing nothing wrong when the cops stopped him. Uh, so it was, it was an unlawful stop under the Fourth Amendment, but they stopped him, they, they ran a search warrant um, on him, and one came up and they were able to frisk him and they found drug paraphernalia and they used that ultimately to, to, to put him into the criminal justice system. You've seen law and order. Typically, that would mean the fruit of the poisonous tree. You can't use that because it's an unlawful stop. But the Supreme Court in a 5-4 decision says, ah, no, you know what, we're going to let that pretext actually go this time. And so racial profiling is yet more of an issue because of that type of case. And what we can be doing right now, and I hate that I, I wasn't able to, to pull this off, is pushing for more reasonable standards when it comes to those types of things. Um, and the final thing I'll say to the specific question of what I'm doing and how people can help is, uh, I'm on, I think, my fifth now justice and injustice panel. We've been having these discussions that are more than just conversations, again, because I think conversing, we should be virtually done with that. And I'm pressing the point of coming up with policies that can not only be implemented, but enforced, but also laws. And so I've had law enforcement on, on, on these um, teleconferences. I've had members of the legislature, including uh, Speaker Frierson and um, um, Senate Major Leader Canizaro, to talk about what ways in which they can pass laws in July that, that can be effective to help address some of these issues. Uh, and what you can do is to tune in tomorrow at two o'clock uh, at my website or on my, or on my uh, Twitter account, and you can see live streams on this, where tomorrow we'll be hearing from organizations like the ACLU and other organizations uh, that are uh, fighting for the civil rights of individuals to hear their opportunities. The last thing I'll say is this. When I talk about it being systemic, um, cr the criminal justice system is an issue we have to address. And so I have uh, at least two more uh, panels in Justice and Injustice that I'm going to invite you to. I'm glad to see some judges on this call because uh, we're going to talk about your component in this as well. The truth of the matter is Black people have not been able to receive the same level of discretion or the benefit of the doubt as our white counterparts have in the criminal justice system. I'm living proof of it. I get arrested because I'm walking to my dorm for being for public intoxication, whereas my white counterpart, female, can call the cops and say, can I get an escort to my dorm because I've been drinking? So, uh, you know, the discretion afforded there was not afforded to me. And, and, and so we recognize that the discretion to arrest is, 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 is instituted differently. We recognize that the discretion to prosecute. And if you're going to prosecute, what you're going to charge them with, uh, that's also a different type of discretion that's been afforded. And then judges, your discretion relative to how you're going to sentence somebody, we're going to be taking a look at that as well to ascertain what we need to do in the criminal justice system in order to effectuate a better relationship between law enforcement and the criminal justice system and the communities that it serves. So thank you so much. Thank you, Attorney General Ford. I will now turn to Assemblywoman Dina Neal. Thank you. So um, I've been thinking about this. So the actions, well, the first action we talked about, which is the Youth Justice Workshop, which has been going on for 11 years now, where we give youth the tools and teach them their rights. LVMBA has been a significant partner 
along with Omega Sci-Fi mm -hmm. and um, Uplift Foundation to basically teach kids their rights, act out traffic stops, act out stop and frisk. Uh, AG Ford has been to a couple of them. Uh, so that was our, that's the first thing. That's a long standing. That's probably going to be forever until we run out of money. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about um, the accountability piece and what would happen um, because, what, and I have to say this because when my child leaves and goes out, um, I check the driveway. I like have a clock and I check the driveway at 4 a.m. to see if he's there because when Trayvon died, Nobody knew that he died and he, they got a call. They did it a missing person and then they found him. And that clicks in my mind all the time because my child is new and he's naive that one day I'm going to wake up and he's not there. And so I've been thinking about what would I do? What would it in my legislative power? What could I do? What would I want? Um, and the first thing I thought about um, was I want city councils who to start reviewing acts of discrimination and acts of bias uh, that are done by the police. I don't want it to be administratively internally done. I want it to be a public record um, because I want um, the elected bodies to have a voice in the process, but I also think it's, it's important that they perform that duty. It's not just the legislature, but they also need to take a role and actually taking a more active role at the council level to review actions and changing the statute in order to allow that to happen. Because I looked at the legal authority under NRS 268, 244, how can we mandate um, that activity? And then the next thing I looked at was the citizen review board that everybody has had so many issues with, right? And trying to make that statutory. What does, what does, and change the makeup of that board. I thought about, um, trying to have equal representation of the diverse and minority groups, mandating that through statute, trying to make sure that uh, we had a public defender, a DA, members of the LVNBA, the Hispanic bar and the state bar and rotating positions of, of police officer of equal rank on the board when an issue comes up and also a senior officer. And then rolling North Las Vegas and Henderson under the citizen review because it's just county. North Las Vegas police actions have no, no relationship uh, to anything at that citizen review board when I was reviewing it. And I was trying to figure out, okay, how can we make it more comprehensive? How can we make um, everybody function at the same level, limit uh, familiar relationships on the board? Because I think we have really tight uh, family relationships in this city that sometimes create bias and limit, uh, I think, ob objectivity. And the third thing that I've been thinking about, which will probably be some of my 2021 bills, was dealing with the academy training. Instead of the 20 hours of training, um, making the 20 hours of training for the cultural bias. So typically within that 18 months, they get their cultural sensitivity. Uh, some of it is online. Uh, making sure that after they leave the academy, there's additional trainings. Making sure that it's not online, that they have real scenarios. Um, training, so actually acting out so we can get to the bias, dealing with, you know, a young black male that, you know, looks suspicious and really so we can get at how an officer uh, naturally reacts. And then I wanted to think about changing the entry of uh, law officers, like letting them enter at 23, but making sure that they're 25, because I think there's a maturity issue uh, with officers going in super young. And I want to make sure that the training um, is done with diverse background. Typically, uh, police, they go in and they learn how to avoid your rights. And I want the training classes to be where they're actually being taught by public defender and other persons of minority bar association for balance. So we can make sure that when those police officers are trained, they're getting all perspectives, not just the, the lawyer who was hired to do the training, that is saying, okay, well, if you have, if you have um, a stop, here's how you can um, recite this in a different way or how you can say that this, you, you felt threatened when you really, there was no evidence of a threat. Um, and I also want to get into the hiring practice. Um, one thing that Metro does is they do a quarterly report 
and they've been sending this, I guess I've been getting it probably the 10 years that I've been um, in the legislature about how many persons of color are being hired. And I started asking that question because there were people in high rank um, officers that weren't getting promotions that weren't being moved up, but no other jurisdiction. No, I mean, when I say North Las Vegas, Henderson, they do not have this report. I wanted to mandate that report and I wanted to mandate um, what kind of information and see that uh, people of color are getting leadership appointments. And I wanted to standardize the testing practices um, to make sure that when someone comes in, the, the, the HR um, or the chief cannot change the testing practices and it's standardized because we still have an issue with uh, literally promoting people who um, follow into the cultural mindset that we may want, we may not want on the street or we may not want that leadership style repeated to individuals. And so I want to really get into the promotional practices to make sure that it's not arbitrary because what they've done is changed the test. They've uh, they've changed the degree requirements. They've done things where statutorily, I think if we had something in place, number one, we would have a remedy, right? Which is most important when there's a remedy rather than trying to seek out the DOJ or seek out NERC, that there's actually some kind of compliance issue that the city councils need to deal with and try to move out that administrative piece to deal with um, promotions, the hiring practices, standardizing it, and making sure that minorities get a fair shake. Because far too often, minorities walk through the door and they get dinged for, for disqualifiers that a white officer did not get dinged for. I've heard this scenario a million times. So when we legalize uh, being able to use marijuana, why is marijuana a disqualifier for you getting high? If it's legal, then there's a question there on what you feel is a component. And I feel like there's a lot of biases that are going in on the, on the HR side and on the um, promotion side on how we keep getting officers learning bad behavior. Because in the George Floyd case, he had two newbies. He had two youngins out there with him. He was teaching them bad practices. But at no point, there should have been a point before he got to 20 years to say, hey, the way you've been policing is wrong and it needs to be addressed. And so those, those are some of the actions that I'm looking at. I sent my bills over to Leslie Turner and she has some group people looking at it, I believe, at plan. And they're going to give me the feedback because typically I, I, I try to do um, balanced policy. I'm never super aggressive because... I, I understand that it's baby steps sometimes to get real reform, but those are my ideas. So if anybody wants to help work on it, tweak it, those are probably going to be my bills for 20, 2021. Thank you, Assemblywoman Neal. I will now turn to Donovan McIntosh. Uh, thank you. Um, so I've been sitting there taking notes, and um, there's a lot of good things that, uh, that I believe that was brought up. Um, number one, uh, attorney Harris brought up about, uh, going to, going to court and watching court and how imbalanced the social justice, uh, the scale of justice really is and how, um, we are not afforded the same opportunities. I think that's a good, uh, that's a great idea. Um, the reasonableness, uh, professor Cooper brought up in the cultural competence. I thought that was uh, very interesting and definitely something that I'm going to look, uh, uh, link it, look into, um, but some of the things that, that I'm taking as far as my position is concerned, uh, I'm in the process of making suggestions to amend policies um, uh, in the regards of uh, body worn cameras. And also to echo what uh, Assemblywoman Dina Neal said, uh, requesting more training on cultural diversity and bias based policing. You have to understand uh, today we're not we're, we're not getting a lot of uh, African-Americans. Uh, being hired on for the position of police officers. You're getting a lot of young uh, uh, white officers who've never never really interacted uh, with with black men, black women, people of color. So so right off, there's a there's a breakdown in communication from you know from the time they arrive. Um, so so I think that's going to be a, a something that I'm going to really strive to to uh, um, re-implement. Uh, as far as uh, more training, um, 
Another thing that I've done is I've established a dialogue uh, with uh, with officers in the Valley on the pros and cons of having uh, these annual uh, psychological evaluations that, that uh, uh, um, you know, has been brought up. And arguably, uh, like I mentioned before, um, there there is so much, there's so much that police officers see on the day-to-day basis, you know, regarding homicides, uh, uh, little children uh, being hurt, uh, uh, the, 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 the countless domestics, you know, and, and, and things of that nature. And, and, I, and I agree, uh, if it doesn't go addressed, you know, there's, there's, there's a buildup, you know, that, that has no outlet. There's no way for, for, for us to release, uh, uh, to release unless, you know, we take it upon ourselves and, 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 and go seek help. Um, but, but, but I see that, uh, as being, uh, something that needs to be addressed. Uh, another thing is I've, I've, uh, uh, I've dedicated my personal time to speak with uh, officers, members of the community, uh, public officials on their views of what's going on in the world and, and its impact on the community and ways to implement change. I mean, there's a there's a there's a lot of power uh, in this group right now. There's a lot of people that have the power to to change laws, to, to implement change and, and, and make things better. And I agree. We don't we don't need lip service. You know, uh, I, I've often said you know, I'm, I'm going to retire here soon and I'm not going to have a badge. I'm not going to have the power and authority that I have right now. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a regular citizen and I'm scared. I am. I'm scared. I live in a predominantly white neighborhood. Um, and, you know, I often think, you know, what's, what's going to happen when the, when the police are, 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 are called on me, you know, when I don't get to, to, to give my credentials, you know, and, and so, so I, I, I will always go back to, bias-based policing and cultural diversity, because I do believe there's a breakdown of communication and these things absolutely need to be addressed. Um, I've also made plans uh, to speak to the youth through the, through the PAL program that's being held at Richard Steele's gym in North Las Vegas, because I believe the children are our future. And, and, and I, and I believe that we start young and we teach them and we educate um, on, on some of the things that, that us as adults, as, as we're struggling with, um, uh, and lastly, um, I spoke to uh, I, I spoke to a lot of veteran officers uh, in the valley, and 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 I came up with an idea that we need to have a sit down. We need to have an open forum where where the, where the public can speak, where police officers can speak, where there's where there's people in the room that have the power to make change can speak. And so I'm hosting an event, uh, an event at the Pearson Community Center on July 16th uh, from six to nine, and it's called. Uh, uh, let's talk. You don't. You don't know my story. You understand, and, and I think it's. A, it, I think it's a great start to, to 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 trying to get a dialogue between the community and, and law enforcement and public officials to identify the problems, both short term and long term, and 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 what what are we going to do to implement change? Um, and so. Uh, I have, you know, spoke to, to the community leaders and these, and these stakeholders uh, because I believe without change, without a plan, um, nothing's, nothing's going to change. And, and we will be here this time next year having the same discussion if changes aren't implemented. So thank you. Uh, thank you. I will now turn to our final panelist, Belinda Harris. Hi, Belinda T. Harris here again. Um, what actions am I doing in my position? I'm doing two things. I am continuing to fight. Um, and I think that within the year of 2020, I think I've been fighting um, harder than I probably ever have fought before due to COVID and having to try to practice law through a glass cont continuously to judges really not listening to my argument because they can't even see my client and they, they don't even think my client is a person. So I think that on an individual level, I'm going to continue to fight. On um, a bigger level, I, you know, there has been some organizing going on, making sure, and just two shouts outs, we have two electeds on, Assemblywoman and our Attorney General, and two things that they're doing that I hope when I get elected I can do is they are speaking to people who are on the ground. As Assemblywoman just said, she gave her bills to plan and mass liberation. These are people who are on the ground doing the work to impacted families. 
um, to this type to our discussion that we're having. So and so as Attorney General with his forms talking to people who are literally on the ground who can tell you what's happening day in and day out to make sure that there is no disconnect on that level. So I, I do applaud our electeds for doing that to make sure that we can get the proper change. So I'm making sure that I keep doing what I'm doing individually. And I'm also trying to be available um, to the community and to be a voice and to listen and bounce ideas off and have strategic meetings about different bills and assemblies and uh, different bills and what we want to pass and what we uh -huh. need to see and how it's practically going to work. So I think that those are that's what I'm doing to make sure um, I can put my email and my address, my email address and my phone number in the chat. I know most of the people on this call I've had some communication with. And I think that as long as we all keep doing what we're doing collectively, that change will happen. Thank you. Uh, I again want to thank our panelists for their thorough and thoughtful answers to the questions. Uh, we had discussed the possibility of additional questions or follow-up, but I will note that we have landed approximately exactly on the estimated uh, time. Uh, so I will uh, just um, check the panelists if they have uh, any comment related to something that someone else said they must say. And I will just say your names quickly. I'm assuming it's unlikely that you've incorporated it, but that it is possible. And then I'm gonna turn to our community stakeholders, but I would ask you to keep that to, to 30 seconds or less. Um, so we have time for the uh, community stakeholders. Um, Professor Cooper, civilian, any final remarks? Civilian oversight, real civilian oversight with subpoena power. That's it. Thank you. Attorney General Ford. I'll just reiterate what I've said. You have to speak up. You have to continue to push the change. Um, speak to, true to power from a position of power. This isn't political for me. Um, I, I remember asking the police union for my for their endorsement when I ran for office. And they asked me, why would it be important to you? And I said, because you know me, you know that I support you. I'm the one who votes, hits the green button for your pension, hits the green button for your insurance, hits the green button for your salaries to the extent I can help and that I want you to take care of yourselves. But you also know I'm gonna hold you accountable. And so I would like to get your endorsement so, so you understand who I am and it would be important to me. They didn't endorse me. I continue to do the work nonetheless, uh, because again, if the worst thing is gonna happen is I get to spend time with my wife and kids, then that's a good thing. So speak up, don't be afraid, unabashedly unintimidated is how you have to proceed with these types of things. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Attorney General Ford. Assemblywoman Dina Neal. I would only say stay focused on the, the change that you want, even if you don't see it happening immediately, Incremental change happens and sometimes we want the whole thing and we get upset and we get tired because we we feel like we've been fighting for so long and year after year it's the same. But all I have to say is don't give up because if, if I'm living proof that I, I all my bills died in my first session so and I but at the at next session and session after that I got some solid pieces out and I just didn't give up. Thank you, Assemblywoman Neal. Donovan McIntosh. Yeah, um, there was a, like I said, there's there's an event uh, July 16th, uh, 6 p.m. to 9. You can register on uh, Eventbrite. Uh, my contact information is Donovan. That's D-O-N-A-V-A-N dot McIntosh at yahoo.com. Uh, if there's any suggestions that I can bring back to my organization, I'm more than open uh, to, to, to do that. Like I said, um, <clears throat> first and foremost, I'm a black man um, and I'm also a law enforcement professional. And um, my duty is to serve and protect the community. And um, if there's anything that I could do, um, just please, please don't hesitate to, uh, to, to reach out. I'm, I'm very open-minded and uh, I'm very, very thick skinned. So feel free to, uh, you know, uh, address any of the concerns that you may have is you know from uh, um, from your perspective uh, and mine as a as a, a law enforcement uh, officer of this community. Thank you. And our final panelist, Belinda T. Harris. I will just say thank you to everybody and echo what everyone else has said and just know that that change is happening. 
there has been a um, shift in the climate and change is absolutely happening. Some of it's small, some of it's big, but it is happening. So we must keep doing what we're doing and seeking justice, which is different than the law because justice looks at the law and says, hey, let's do the right thing. So we're on the right side of history here, people. Let's stay that way. Thank you. Now we will now be transitioning to the next segment of our programming. Um, and I'm going to thank our panelists again uh, for their 